everybody. It has been an honor, really has, for us to continue working and helping provide a, a, bright, spot, uh, a bright spot for fans in these difficult times. Uh, I obviously am looking forward to Saturday's double or nothing. Uh, personally, uh, my match with Lance Archer for the TNT Championship and us vying to be the, the first individual to wear it. Uh, the rest of the double or nothing show will be nothing short of spectacular from the casino ladder match to the AEW world championship on the line, really just an outstanding night. And if we can, you know, take a beat and look back, this is where AEW began our, our first event officially double or nothing last year sold out MGM grand. Uh, the circumstances are different this year uh, with the pandemic and COVID-19, but that spirit exists. Uh, otherwise we wouldn't be, uh, on this call. And just for all those attending the webinar and this call, uh, we wanted to do this safely and responsibly. So we're all in separate rooms. Some of us are in different states. And as I often say on BTE, I'm, I didn't go to college, so I'm not the most technically savvy. So if we have any issues, we'll do everything we can to make sure uh, we get your uh, questions answered. There's a lot more folks on this call than there uh, usually are. So we want to get right to it. And I am glad to Start taking questions. All right. Thanks, Cody. So I'm going to open up the lines here. First off is going to be Connor Casey from Comic Book. Connor, can you hear us? And you're, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. You're up. Awesome. Uh, Cody, hey, thanks for taking the time to do this today. Really appreciate it. Um, they mentioned the card at the top of the top of the call, and I was just curious, um, how close is this card compared to what you guys had planned, say, back in early March before so many different things had to change? That's a great question. I actually would say this card, um, you know, just to peel the curtain back a, a bit, 90% uh, of what we potentially had planned. Uh, obviously, we were presented with a curveball, and we're, we're at the plate, and we're, we're hoping uh, to connect. But not a lot of things changed uh due to COVID-19 and the pandemic uh in terms of creative one thing that's just a really bright spot in all of this and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it is uh during this period of time uh all all the credit has got to go to Tony Khan obviously the owner and the and the founder of AEW but I mean big time George Washington crossing the Delaware uh, type stuff in terms of the shows we did in Norcross and the amount of matches uh, we had and the patchwork of, of putting these e events together, him, Kevin Sullivan, Jim Morris. I just want to shout them out. But I, to answer your question, not a great deal has changed. We've been fortunate to have uh, our, our stars and our, our lead individuals on the show. And last night, a really nice moment to have not only Matt and Nick Jackson, the Young Bucks back, but also Hangman and Adam Page. Thank you, Connor. Okay, next up, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Bill Bodkin and from Pop Break. Bill, you're with us? Yes, guys. Can you hear me all right? We can. Hey, Bill. All right. Hey, Cody. I love doing these. Thanks for taking the time. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about was What's the mindset going into? Obviously, it's a little different with no crowd, but double or nothing the first time. You're the young upstart company, first show ever. Obviously, a lot riding on it. Now you're going into year one, year either your second year now with double or nothing. What's the mindset of you as an EVP and you as performer heading into double or nothing too? I think one thing that's particularly very important to me. Um, is, is self-awareness. And I, I was aware of where we were last year in, in the Double or Nothing. And we, a lot of things were discussed about the, the product. Uh, there's a lot of folks who joke about how everything we did during that period of time was almost micro-analyzed and, and taken just such a deep dive on everything we said because we didn't know what AEW would look like. And here we are a year in, and this is double or nothing too, as, as you put it. And we're starting to see, uh, we're evolving right in front of uh, the audience. What is uh, the piece of AEW that's the most prominent? Is it the fact that there is such a diverse uh, series of styles amongst the EVPs who all have such a role 
in the company? Um, is it trending in one direction? So for me, the mindset uh, is, is just to continue to make double or nothing destination programming, to continue to make double, you know, AEW destination programming and take what is, is working and what, what people enjoy. And that's incredibly difficult to quantify when you have no audience screaming and, and booing and things of that nature. So you have to really uh, analyze and hope and, and to some degree guess um, what people may love or like, but I've been very self-aware throughout this process. And I know the company may look differently uh, than it did, but in my eyes, it looks, it looks so beautiful because there's such a diverse palette on this show. And I'll give you uh, examples. You have this TNT championship match, this true sports-based tournament that just w crazy. The fact that Warner media and TNT wanted a belt of their own. I can't think of a time in wrestling that the presenting network actually said we want our own belt. And it was an honor to be in, in that tournament. And then you have Hikuru Shida, and Nyla Rose in, you know, no disqualification and no count outs. And uh, you have the stadium stampede, something we've never seen before, taking advantage of the, the stadium structure here uh, in Jacksonville. And you have young upstarts. Uh, it reminds me so much of like, you know, and please don't do pick this apart, but I will say it reminds me so much of a young, stunning Steve Austin and natural Dustin Rhodes when it comes to somebody like MJF and Jungle Boy uh, and them just, just vying for who is that future face. The casino ladder match, uh, to have surprises in there and to have that flavor of wrestling presented there and, and there being a genuine prize to it all. It's just a very diverse show. So I guess to answer your question, sorry for being so long-winded, is my mindset is let this be the most diverse show. Let this be a buffet for wrestling, but make sure it's the best damn buffet that there is. Fantastic. Thanks to both of you. Uh, next up, uh, Stephanie Francomi from Vulture Hound. Stephanie, are you with us today? Hi, Cody. This is Stephanie from Steel Chair Magazine in the United Kingdom. Uh, calling you from France. Uh, I wanted to ask you... Uh, how different as uh, the approach uh, on the to the shows changed uh, since you shifted to since the shift to closed arenas? Uh, thank you. Thank thank you, and always nice uh, hearing from you. Uh, I this is this is so wild. There's so many stories online about what precautions uh, you know wrestling is taking in presenting this, but just to get in the hallway where my office is here at, at Daly's place, I have to get a temperature check. So not only a temperature check in the parking lot, but a temperature check to get into this hallway. You've seen on the program, if you watch dynamite, the wristbands on everybody's wrist, uh, doing COVID testing in quarantine situations so that you don't cross pollinate, uh, the ring crew working, uh, overtime to sanitize the, the use of mask, uh, uh, as much as you, you possibly can. It's just been a really unique challenge. Doc Sampson and Bryce, our medical team, are already presented with the challenge of a violent wrestling show. Now there's this global pandemic, and they have just been so above and beyond and countless hours in making sure that everyone is genuinely tested. No one in this bowl, in this uh, building, no one touching a camera or, or wrestling in that ring hasn't been tested. And that was something uh, that I, I'm very proud of, Team Medical, and how they've done. So that's from the production side of it. From the creative side of it, and again, I, if you've never been on these calls, folks, I get a bit long-winded, so forgive me. But on the creative side of things, I have loved this challenge because you don't have anyone to throw your weight belt to. You don't have that instant gratification of knowing this spot worked, this spot didn't work. You don't have that. And what a way to test your skills. I'm obsessed with wrestling. And I think anyone who knows me on this call knows I'm obsessed with it. So this has presented itself as a I really want because to me, okay, no, there's no one but there are people sitting at home. They're sitting there with their, their, you know, family, you know, families together and they're watching wrestling and it's my job 
to entertain them. And I can't know for sure if I'm doing it. And it's, it's beautiful that we have social media. There's, there is a bright side to social media folks. And, and, and it's beautiful that we have Warner media to tell us, Hey, how many people tuned in for this and things of that nature. And I don't want to get too analytical, but, uh, I, I just really have relished the challenge and uh, I don't want to selfishly speak just to me. It's very clear who, who really stepped up during this period of time. I'll give you a prime example of that being Chris Jericho. This is a nightmare for a performer, but in a way has been a dream because I think swords have been sharpened. I think people have honed their skills uh, and they're going to come out of this, uh, pandemic as better wrestlers and that just creates a better wrestling show for the wrestling fan thanks Steph, and thanks thanks cody <clears throat> next up uh, i'd like to introduce bill pritchard from wrestle zone bill are you there hey can you guys hear me we can okay, so um i wanted to clarify something tony khan said the uh TNT Championship was going to be the number two position in the rankings, and I just wanted to ask if you can clarify how that's going to work in terms of, you know, it was sorry, it's three through eight, or I'm sorry, three through six, going to be in line for different title shots, or just some clarification on that? Okay, I can answer that. Could you mute your line, because there's a little bit of feed. Oh, perfect. Uh, to, uh, to answer your question about the placement, of the TNT championship. Uh, when we got to the semifinals, uh, Tony Khan uh, did address everyone in the tournament individually. Uh, the way it's currently looking is that it will not be, uh, that the champion, the TNT champion will not be ranked. They, they, he will be listed as a champion. Whereas uh, currently John Moxley has big, big platinum and is the world champion. The TNT champion will not be ranked. Uh, so, so those titles, we're not going to look at them as one and two. Uh, and that's because we want to see what, what becomes of the TNT title. Uh, and the only way we can do that, we can't tell you here and now, hey, it's, it's going to be a workhorse title. We can't tell you it's going to be a mid-card title. We can't say any of those things because we've never seen it before. I've literally never seen uh, the belt. So it will, it will grow and have an identity of its own. But I can say as far as the rankings go, the top five will all be non-champions. Uh, so the TNT champion and the world champion will be unranked individuals. The top five does tend to, to skew towards what well, number one is going to wrestle uh, for the world championship, but we'll see how Tony uh, takes that step further as someone who's, you know, a firm believer in kind of the sports-based ladder system that is involved with rankings and the quality of wins and things of that nature. We'll see where it goes, but the TNT champion will no longer be ranked. All right. Thanks, Bill. Next up, uh, let's introduce Dave LaGreca from SiriusXM. Dave, welcome. Hey, Cody. How are you? Thank you for this. First off, how did you get? This is a serious call. This is a. This is. A, I'm. I'm sitting here sweating bullets. Uh, yeah, this is a serious call, and you're on here. Your question better be the best question asked, or I'm going to come and find you and literally kick your ass. And everyone on this call is a witness to that. It better be the actually, best question ever. I actually have two questions for you, Cody. Um, okay. You know, before we get to Saturday, it's the 40th anniversary of Empire Strikes Back. So I was wondering how you're going to celebrate that today. And then looking ahead to Saturday uh, with Brody Lee, who really never had an opportunity to have a main event match or a championship match, you know, being on the stage, you know, really quick after his debut, being not only in a championship match, but a main event match for double or, mu double or nothing on Saturday. Well, uh, I'll answer the, the latter first. And it's a very much a proving ground for somebody like uh, Mr. Brody. Uh, I, I really, I, I, he probably will likely not appreciate what I'm going to say, but I will say it. I'm very proud of Brody Lee uh, in a different aspect in a world that people don't see. Uh, he's stepped up considerably as a leader. This, this locker room is very young uh, and it, need, it needs leaders. I always was in locker rooms that had, great leaders and uh, you know, the wrestling etiquette uh, was taught correctly without bullying or anything of that nature. And the respect aspect of 
why we shake each other's hands every 30 seconds. It's all right there. And Mr. Brody, Sean Spears, two guys who have really brought that to the forefront, but his match is a proving ground. Um, that guy, that guy can go big rig can go. And uh, I very much look forward to, to him and John Moxley. We all of a sudden went from being a very light heavyweight company to the board is now filled. You've got individuals like Wardlow. You've got individuals like Luchasaurus, Mr. Brody, uh, my opponent in Lance. You have these super heavyweights converging, and it's really exciting to see. Uh, the former, in your initial question, the Empire Strikes Back, I will have to wait. Uh, if anybody knows me, I get very nervous before pay-per-views. I, I don't take in any revelry. I, I don't, I don't drink. I don't, I don't, I don't party. I, I'm very just singular focus and I know it can border on obsession, uh, but that's, I want, I want to win and I want the company to win. And uh, the empire strikes back my favorite movie on earth and the best movie of all time can wait until the work is done. And hopefully that'll be Saturday night. And if it's anything like when I normally watch The Empire Strikes Back, Brandy will fall asleep around the Hoth battle, which is right at the beginning, and I will enjoy it and love it and get my wisdom from Yoda as he always gives it to me. So, Dave, I want you to off the call now. That was it. And I, uh, I wish you the best, Dave, in your future endeavors. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Um, thanks, Cody. Joe Reedy from the Associated Press is up next. Joe, are you with us? Yeah, I am. Cody, thanks for um, doing the call. It, just with um, being at Daly's Place for the last couple months, what have you guys, have you gotten more comfortable with the venue and what have you learned as far as maybe expanding and working in different spots? Like I know you did the Falls Count Anywhere match a, a couple weeks ago. Daly's place is incredibly special. It was it was already special for us uh, before the the pandemic. In a way, as a bit of a, a home arena, obviously being the parking lot was where we had the initial AEW press conference. For me, uh, there's a lot of uh, tools in this uh, sandbox in terms of the space. It's something that I, we're so fortunate to have is Daly's and its surrounding infrastructure. I just love the fact that the sun sets. Uh, I, you know, just a personal aside, the sun sets as the show uh, is beginning and going on. And it's a really just kind of a beautiful lighting treatment. Uh, one of our master lighting guys, Greg, uh, I know it is a pain for him because he's having to adjust. But I love that. And I love the win last night watching Jake and Arn, Ander Arn Anderson sermonized and seeing the wind blow. To have that open air amphitheater that is Daly's place, uh, really, uh, it's made things very easy uh, for us. We have a lot of contingencies, a lot of the, uh, places as the world open, opens up that want AEW, and Raphael Morphy and Chris Harrington have been wonderful about potentially looking into those places. But if we wrestled at Daly's, for the foreseeable future, I, I would I would have no problem with that. It's a, it's a tremendous place, and I can't thank the Khan family enough for having it available uh, for us to work and for us to work safely. But there's a lot of, to answer your question, a lot of tools in that sandbox. Uh, Flex Field is behind Daly's Place. Uh, the bridge on the club section goes over to the main stadium. Uh, so there is, there's a lot of room for us within the show to play with in areas you might see. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Cody. Uh, Jim Barcelone from the Miami Herald is up next. Jim. Yeah, thank you, Cody. If, um, follow a little bit up on that because you did answer it a little bit in the previous question, but Florida and Governor DeSantis has been the leader in opening up to pro wrestling. Does it make sense to remain in Florida and Jacksonville because of no crowds rather than to travel to other states, no crowds? Or is the plan as more states open up moving forward to go to other states' venues with no crowds. So I would say the plan right now is to to stay in one spot, and the reason being, you put your you put your talent and your production in, in at risk when you when you move uh, the the show around, and obviously we can meet that 
risk with proper medical management and the testing and the temperature checks and the quarantine aspect of it all. But it is easier uh, to, to be in this one spot from now. I don't want to get in a rhythm where we're stuck because I, I do hope that the world safely opens back up where the fans can come back in the seats. That live aspect of what we do is incredibly uh, important. But if it was up to me, which it is not, uh, I share the executive role with three other wonderful gentlemen and Tony Khan makes the final decisions. But if it was up to me, I would stay here uh, until it's time to let fans back in and even potentially let fans back in at Daly's first, you know, I, there's no secret that the parking lot's starting to fill up with fans. I made a little trip out there yesterday. Uh, you know, we can't shake hands or hug, but we can at least acknowledge one another's love for the industry. But uh, it's the safest decision to stay here uh, while the uh, pandemic and COVID and that situation uh, as we move through it. Thanks, Jim. Um, we've got a number of uh, journalists who have uh, written their questions in. Uh, which is which is a feature that's available, and we'd like to start with one here, also a Jacksonville question uh, from Darren Palter at uh, uh, B13 and the Palter Cast. And the question for you, Cody, is: Is there an AEW accomplishment that you're most proud of uh, to this point? And then, since that you're now spending a lot of time in Jacksonville, what do you love most about being in Jacksonville? What do you love most about being in the city? Accomplishment, you know, I. I I'm not always like I am in some of my interviews in terms of uh, I don't really have a braggadocious personality. So I, I know there are some milestones we've hit that are really special. Uh, but one maybe that I've pat us on the back is I'm very excited for the AEW unrivaled toys uh, to hit shelves, uh, wicked cool toys, jazz wares, uh, Dana Massey, Mark Kaplan, Nick Sobic. What a just wonderful job. On, on immortalizing the roster and uh, making a product that is for uh, fans, collectors, the hardcore collector, but also the kids who are watching the show, the kids who will play uh, with these action figures, just like I played with my figures and had all my battle royals and things of that nature. Um, that's something, and maybe it's because I'm literally sitting here working on the edit for a piece of <laughs> content related to it, but that's something that I... I really am proud of us uh, for doing. And again, I said it on the call and I don't want to harp on it, but the, the shows that took place in the, in the nightmare factory, me and QT Marshall's wrestling school, which is not affiliated with AEW, but we happen to have that infrastructure to do our, those four shows. in. I was so proud. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie, the replacements with Keanu Reeves, it felt a lot like that. There were so many young uh, men and women uh, who stepped up uh, a lot were in enhancement matches. Some were in very competitive matches, but to, to see them and to, and to get to know them was special. Uh, all of them. I, I tried to list as many as I could in a social post the other day, uh, but some of them won't be replacements moving forward. Some people in this, you know, dark time, their bright spots and some contracts might've been handed out, <laughs> things of that nature. But uh, I was very proud. Of, of those shows, the Nightmare Factory shows. And I, I'm very proud of the AEW Unrivaled toy deal with Jeremy and Wicked Cool Toys. And then my rant, I forgot if there was another part of your question. So if I didn't answer it, I apologize. Well, we're good. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on so that we can get to as many people in as possible. So uh, next up, I'd like to introduce Stu Myrick from KTXXFM. Stu. Stu, are you there? Stu, you might, you need to unmute. Uh, there you go. There we go. Now we're good. Damn technology. Cody, greetings from the mighty ATX. Hey, buddy. Uh, quick question. Is there an adjustment that AEW has had to make in light of COVID-19, in light of the pandemic, that you could see carrying forward when we get back to some semblance of normalcy? I think it's an adjustment that a lot of businesses are probably have seen the same one that I'm going to identify. It's wrestling. If you've ever been backstage at a wrestling show, uh, everyone shakes everyone's hands. Uh, there are different reasons and it depends on who trained you. They'll tell you why I was always taught 
they're picking you up. It's their responsibility to put you down and send you home to your family safely, whatever it may be. But the handshaking aspect and that type of uh, physical nature may be something that is passe. I was talking with Colt Cabana about this the other day. Uh, it's disappointing not to be able to shake hands and, and hug and things of that nature. But if it prevents this, you know, this virus, if it prevents it from moving to one person to the next, then it's a measure that should be taken. And perhaps something moving forward, handshaking is not as prominent as it was in wrestling. So that that's one in particular. And on top of the litany of, you know, if anything, also, we have now a whole new chapter in AEW history with crisis management and how we handle this. God forbid another pandemic presents itself or perhaps there's a pandemic on, you know, the forefront and something that's been forecasted where we can do our best as a company uh, to make sure we're practicing the pra uh, best practices to prevent it and do things safely. We all were handed COVID-19 pretty much with no clue uh, uh, what to do. I think we're a little bit more prepared in crisis management as a company. Thanks both. Chuck Carroll from CBS. <clears throat> Chuck, are you with us? Um, Cody, my question is, what if, God forbid, somebody in the company does unfortunately test positive right now for COVID-19, the coronavirus? What steps are in place? What measures are there in place that would ensure that you all would be able to continue moving forward? That's a great question. The testing is done under, under quarantine measures. Uh, you have scheduled out uh, blocks uh, for the testing, and Team Medical is the very first uh, individuals to be tested. So there is there there is no cross pollination. We don't have because they're not done at Daly's place. They're done under the quarantine measures. Meaning, uh, if you were to test positive, uh, you would then get the no swab test to confirm the positive, or perhaps it was a false positive. But you would not be uh, in proximity uh, to any uh, uh, of the talent, to any of the crew. They've also separated. The crew has uh, their testing measures are done elsewhere and the talent testing measures are done elsewhere. So those are also two locations. It's been a lot about spreading out uh, per our, you know, dual doctor role. And we also have multiple doctors because you then could cross pollinate potentially if there's a, a positive on a test. So we have it set where it would not shut down the production. And I am absolutely not rooting for a positive test, but we do need to keep in mind and UFC just went through this. We're testing everyone who comes into our bowl, everyone, everyone who you can see with your own eye. So if a positive test was to come forward, well, it would just indicate that the testing does work and that the measures need to be taken. We, however, have been incredibly fortunate to have no positive tests. Hopefully we have no positive tests moving forward, but doing them under quarantine measures, according to Doc Michael Sampson, as some of you may know, um, he's been in the wrestling industry quite some time, uh, has been the right call for everybody. All right. Thank you. Emily Pratt from Uprox is next. Emily. Oh, sorry. I had the same question about someone testing positive. You, you got another question? You want to come up with something? Uh, let's see. What's your uh, favorite? I'll ask you a question. I'll ask you a question. What's your favorite energy drink? Oh, probably Red Bull. Just a Red Bull, huh? Yeah, very basic. I'm What's digging the. <laughs> my favorite energy drink is the Bang, and I have uh, my fridge has a bunch of peach mangoes in it at the moment. So that is uh, that's where I'm sticking. Now I'm trying to break off of caffeine like this, and in terms of the super creatine Bangs and the C4s, and I'm trying just to go back to black coffee, or perhaps even like the extract, the green tea extract, just because we're the guinea pig for this aspartame generation. And I don't know if these things are going to be any good for us uh, 20 years from now, but Hey, I got a lot of respect for a Red Bull person. It gives you wings. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Emily and Cody. We're going to go to the, uh, to, to the emails here, the text questions uh, to the AJ awesome show. 
<clears throat> AJ, I'd like to know, Cody, if there are any advantages, uh, anything that's been like a positive of, of having shows without fans in attendance. Hmm. I mean, I think the overview, the overlying advantage is that you're really tested as a performer and a competitor. How do you tell this physical story with no fans to help you with no uh, background music uh, to ride? So that over that that's been a positive. But to be frank, there really hasn't been any other positives in terms of we very much miss the fans. We miss each other. It is there is a need as a wrestler uh, for a fan, and you know Hulk Hulk hulking up. Uh, every aspect of a really good wrestling match and the psychology of it, it depends. And I know there are different flavors, but wrestling depends on the crowd and, and depends on one another. So we're now working for this crowd that's at home and we're hoping and we're guessing and things of that nature. Uh, but mainly the positive has been becoming a better performer and a better wrestler, but overall, I can't say how much I miss it on a personal level. And I know the locker room misses it on, on, on the fans and, and hopefully we can have them back soon. Fantastic. Uh, next question is from Zach McGibbon from TSN. Zach, are you there? Thank you all. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question surrounding uh, Mike Tyson in terms of how he was able to come in. You mentioned earlier that about 90% of the card had been uh, planned out before the pandemic. Was Mike Tyson part of those original plans before the pandemic hit? And how did that deal come together with Mike Tyson? Mike Tyson is actually somebody that we met as a company at Double or Nothing last year. And over the course of the year, uh, we've come to really respect him as a, as a fan uh, of what we do. And he's a, a hardcore uh, AEW fan. I would say, though, that's one of the, the last uh, touches uh, that, was, that was put on uh, the double or nothing uh, in terms of who will be the one to present that championship and, and someone with a element of prestige and that is what Mike is there uh, to do uh, Saturday night. Hopefully he will be handing it to me, but he is there to hand the championship uh, to Lance uh, or myself. And it's been fun to get to know Mike over the past year. Thanks Cody. Uh, next we've got uh, a question here from Michael Shalik from sescoops.com uh, comes in from the, from the text. Will we see the TNT championship belt before Saturday night, Cody? Well, I haven't seen it. Dang it. Uh, things leak in wrestling. Uh, you never know. I know there are some, uh, as we kind of go over and uh, a format, uh, this, this wonderful show, which we hope is the best AEW show to date. There has there has been talk of potentially uh, it it being it being seen before, but I think my personal preference would be to see it live for the first time uh, when it comes comes out of the bag. Not unlike how Bret Hart presented uh, Big Platinum in the AEW World Championship. Uh, so I would lean towards you're not going to see it yourself until I see it for the first time. Uh, but you, you never know. Fair enough. Okay, we're going to go back to the to the text line here. Lewis Brown from Hooked on Wrestling. He's got a question. We've seen a lot of big stars come to AEW, but who on the roster currently on the mid card do you see as being the next breakout main eventer? Oh, well, I mean, the answer is not an answer I like giving, but it, but I think everyone sees the same thing. MJF is destined for something incredibly great. Uh, he, he truly is. He's, he's a very different type of wrestler, uh, is very adaptive type of wrestler. Uh, I look at what him and jungle boy have on Saturday as a snapshot of the future. They're both growing, you know, physically wrestling is a physical company and we you know wrestling physical business we have so many light heavyweights but to see them train as hard as they do to eat properly uh they're both putting on good drug-free healthy size and they're both expanding their game they're not even even 
near their prime. Uh, Jungle Boy, somebody, Sammy Guevara, every week has done something on television that has made you want to look into Sammy Guevara more. Uh, I don't know why it's all the bad guys, but Sammy, uh, incredibly special. If you have the, she is another person who could break out the fact that she's really diverse. And if you check out her social, social media, it's the definition of wholesome in terms of a worldwide and uh, global star. Wardlow, I, it, I'm going to sit here and name every wrestler we have uh, because I really believe in uh, a great many of them. And whether friend or foe, and Max is definitely not a friend, it's my job. It's, it's my job to, to present, you use the term mid-card, that entire mid-card, as they're not stuck in the mid. They're, they're climbing uh, to the top. Darby Allen, I could, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Darby. Just incredibly smart, growing as well. Uh, it's just a very special, you know, the, there's the potential for a great many people to slip into the main event, especially with a ranking system. Uh, you take a look at best friends potentially slipping into the number one contender spot based on their buy-in. Trent Beretta alone, though, is a really stout, stout singles wrestler and somebody who could break out uh, and be a legitimate contender. There's a lot of options. Uh, and that, I hope, is the sign of a great company. Uh, and I hope guys will meet those challenges when they arise. Thanks, Cody. I've, I've got a, a couple more here that are coming in on text. <clears throat> Next one comes from Daniel Wood from Sports Skeeta. Creatively, is there anything you, Cody, or any of your colleagues have attempted only to realize it just doesn't work in an empty arena setting or without an audience. Well, uh, it's a great question. I mean, there's, there are things that, that maybe not work isn't the term as much as maybe aren't personal flavors, but there's been an aspect of experimentation. Uh, one example is the microphone. So people will ask you, why do you got a microphone? There's no fans. Well, the microphones are actually for the cameras as well. They're lob mics are available and stick mics. Uh, so that's something that's been kind of always, I sit back on the shows I'm not wrestling on and a little bit of a sticking point, like, why do we need these mics? But then when you take away the mics, you can't hear what anyone is saying unless you lob mic them. I'm getting uh, very uh, technical here. Uh, but one thing we have been fortunate to have is we do have the boys and girls on the roster there in the crowd and they're obviously they've been in the, they're all industry folks. So they're the most jaded audience you could get, but to be able to move them in any way is actually a great barometer of how things are going in the ring. So we've not had to just have crickets or silence uh, because we've been able to have the boys and girls in the, in the, uh, in the seats, uh, you know, at, at socially distanced and things of that nature and with masks. And again, everybody is tested, uh, but that's really made it so that we're not just dealing with utter silence. And uh, that alone scares me half to death. I mean, that's the wrestler's nightmare is, is silence. So that, that's one thing. The only thing to really answer your question that I get a little iffy and sticky on from time to time is our use of microphones when we have no main uh, large mass gathering audience. Okay, great. Thanks, Cody. Um, <clears throat> let's see. We got uh, Richard Jones from Fox Sports Rochester. Any word on the talked about second show uh, in, in Rochester? Oh, we're, hey, we're going to make it to Rochester. We're, 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 we're going to get there. We, uh, I've, I really like something that we've done in terms of shows have not just been canceled. Almost every show that we've lost has, has been postponed. So you'll probably in the next, I'd say two weeks, uh, see some new presented dates uh, with potential shows. And I'm hoping, you know, everyone has their own theory and speculation and everyone's an expert on when fans are going to come back and when they're not going to come back. But I would hope, I would tend to think sooner than later if we can do it. And maybe there is, you know, a small gathering and there's, there could be limitations to it all, but uh, Rochester will for sure happen. That was a show we were really, really uh, looking forward to. I, I particularly wanted to see Brody Lee in Rochester uh, just because I know uh, that's his hometown. So it, it, it's not something that's going to get pushed very far, 
on the back burner. The only live event plans that might take further to to replace or renew is any international live event plans because that we're we're you know just like everybody else we're we're waiting for when the borders will open up and how the borders will open up. I got one more here on text that I'd like to share with you, um, Cody. <clears throat> this comes from Christian Hubbard uh, from the Illuminati. Um, his question uh, is Broken Matt Hardy will team up with the Bucks and Kenny Omega and Hangman this Saturday, collectively as the elite. Is Hardy an official member of the elite? And what do you hope that he accomplishes in the company? Matt Hardy is wonderful. He last night, I got the privilege to sit outside and just have a beautiful view of the Jacksonville waterfront with Matt and to hear him tell stories to some of the younger guys and really special veteran who is, you know, not unlike my brother is able to continue to go. It's really great having his, his presence. As far as the elite is concerned, I'll go ahead and say it. It's probably the most controversial thing in this call. And I don't mean it to be the elite more than anything is the original, the OG and that being Kenny Omega and Matt and Nick Jackson, that that's the heartbeat of it all. Those guys are, are glue and they do everything individually uh, together. And, and they're, I mean, look at it. Kenny was PWI's wrestler of the year last year. Uh, and Matt and Nick Jackson, I don't know how many tag team accolades they've won. Uh, incredibly polarizing figures, but they're polarizing because they're damn, damn good. That's the elite. And then you've got kind of the, uh, expanded universe elite and you know hangman out in page and uh marty Skrull, bless his soul and i would assume that broken matt is uh, is trial by fire here as someone who's uh under the elite banner i'll tell you on a personal level the reason i go so hard on the nightmare family and the jackets and everything is out of respect for the elite this is that that's their world it's it's an honor to have been selected to be part of it uh, and to have, have been with those guys, uh, we're, we're a family, uh, and that's very, very special. But at the end of the day, the OG will always be the OG elite will always determine who is elite, Kenny, Matt, and Nick. And, uh, I think Matt gets a, what would you call it? A battlefield, uh, promotion perhaps to the elite. 